TV and in today's episode we're going to be talking about the most important aspect of our children's lives which is education. We're talking about the right school boards, the right curriculum and international education. Joining us today we have Kimberly Dixit, president and co-founder of the Red Pen. Hi Kim. Hi. Kim, can you sum up uh, the Red Pen for me in about 140 characters? The Red Pen is your partner in planning and preparing for a global education. Awesome. So Kim, this is like one of the most requested conversations on Kids Stop Press. So you have a lot of questions coming your way. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you share with us about the education scenario in India and how has it evolved since you started the Red Pen about five years ago? Uh, I think what has really changed is awareness. People are much more aware of, you know, what different um, kinds of education mean, what kinds of education are out there. Schools have changed, a lot more international schools have opened up, um, and even colleges, there are more um, colleges with different kinds of, offering different kinds of um, learning experiences for students. So there's a lot of change going on. Right. Um, Kim, what are the different boards? I mean, we've seen uh, the influx of a lot of new curriculums and boards come into India yes. versus the conventional boards that have existed. What's your take on each one of them and what are the different boards that we have today? So, I mean, one of the most popular boards across India is the CBSE board. And I think, you know, parents should feel comfortable that that's a very rigorous board. It's recognized globally as um, a curriculum that prepares students well for education um, anywhere, you know, higher education anywhere. And I think that, um, you know, in addition, we have a lot of new international boards coming up, like the IGCSC, the IB, um, and the A levels. Even you know, American schools which open in India can run the AP system and the American high school curriculum. So you know, there are many, many options, and I think. Um, like I said, I think parents should understand what their goals are and objectives and understand their children or children's own learning style. Um, I think that's very, very important and I, I hear those stories all the time about parents who struggled or were frustrated and then sort of just made a, a switch in the, the, the student's entire learning um, approach to learning changed. So sometimes, you know, the, the student just doesn't learn what, well on a particular board. So, you know, as we know, our, for example, ICSE board that our students study in is quite rote, it's quite, but it's very rigorous. Students do learn a lot of facts. Um, they may or may not be able to be encouraged to do kind of analytical thinking on the same level as they might be, but might be in the IGCSE. But for some students, you know, that's, that, that opens up other kinds of, um, I don't know, intellectual pathways for them. So every student is different um, and it is important to take the time and understand what's best for your child. Right. Uh, but obviously parents are making this decision very early on in a child's right, life because right. you know the madness that surrounds yes. school admissions. Yes. Forget not only Bombay but of course in Delhi it's a different ball game altogether. So how does a parent deal with, uh, you know, making those decisions? Like is there some, is there like a thought process that a parent should have that Yes. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, the child at four or five, I mean, there are very few characteristics that a parent can actually right, pick up right. at right there. I think, you know, I mean, again, one of the most important things that, that parents need to keep in mind is that they have to be open-minded. They have to be flexible. And just because they didn't you know, sort of learn in this way doesn't mean that, that it's not the best learning for their child, right? And the other thing is be willing to change. You really do have to be willing to change, you know? Um, you may have two children, one who's doing really well in a particular school and one who's not, and you may have to change the school for one child. And I think, you know, and I think it is a big shame that, you know, we have a lot of K-12 through schools that um, you know, seats never open up again and yeah. parents are completely stressed out that if I lose this seat in this school I'll never get one again. But, you know, um, the, the fact that new schools are opening up all the time means that there are options. Options are being created that, you know, may suit your child better and you may not know that for a few years, so be willing to change. Sure. Um, our, you know, a lot of parents have asked us this question that, like you said, a large part of India still has the CBSC board, which is prevalent. Do you feel like if you're from a particular board, be it CBSC or IB or whatever, your chances of getting into foreign universities or pursuing international education is higher? So it's a good question, and I understand why people think that international boards, you know, um, are better if you want to pursue international education. And it's true to some extent, but at the same time, you know, of the students that I've worked with, I, I honestly have to say that the majority of them have not been from international boards, the ones who've been extremely successful and achieved what, you know, a lot of families think of as, you know, very prestigious placements. So I don't think that... Um, it's compulsory to put your student, your child into an international board to to achieve those goals. 
Uh, then let's start with the Indian versus the international uh, education. Do you think international education is still very aspirational in India? Um, um, you mean going abroad or yes. studying an international curriculum within India? Both. Okay. Um, aspirational in the sense, yes, I mean, I think many people feel that that's, that's a path to sort of a better, a, a better future, a, a better understanding of the world and being a more competitive, um, you know, career or, or professional. Um, but it, yes, it's aspirational. Many people sort of, that's their goal. I'm not sure people really understand why that's their goal. So I think that's an important step in the process is to, for people to stop and understand <laughs> why do I want to... Why, why am I doing this? this. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, in, in a former question where we discussed about the different boards and, you know, does one board give you a leverage over the other? I think uh, you raised a very valid point about, um, you know, it's not, not most of your students placed are from international boards. Right. So which boards were they and what was the kind of profiling yeah. that went into that trial? Um, you know, they, they've been from... Um, ISC boards, HSC boards, which are you know the which are, which are state boards, um, and CBSE as well. So all of them, all of the boards have been sort of represented, and um, I think what I what I find is those students, you know, that 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 board hasn't defined them or their profile, right? right. They have kind of um, moved beyond it, and even students who are successful who are in the IB, they have to move beyond that. You cannot you you cannot be defined by your curriculum. You cannot be you know, there is no perfect IB student that is being sought around the world. You know, right. people are looking, especially for U.S. applicants, you know, colleges are really looking for real human beings who've done what drives them and what they're passionate about. Absolutely. And um, so when, when we're saying uh, this, you know, like you brought up the whole HSC or plus 12, mm -hmm. uh, as it's popularly called in India, what's the path of somebody who's looking at pursuing their undergrad uh, in the U.S. or in the U.K. about you know, do they, if they're doing the IB or the HSC or doing any other stream, how do they, uh, you know, apply for those and how do they apply for the Indian competitive exams that there are? So students who are in the IB would have a very, very hard time um, um, appearing for um, competitive entrance exams in India. Right. It's just there isn't enough time if you want to do well in your IB curriculum and why wouldn't you, right? You've right. invested so much time and money and energy into um, that curriculum, so you obviously want to do well in um, in those subjects and those exams. So I think students who are in the IB who really feel strongly that they want to pursue something like an IIT um, would need to take a gap year okay. and focus on that um, that kind of preparation. But also keep in mind, if students are interested in medicine, um, the IB does not allow, it, medicine in India requires three sciences and the IB does not allow students to take three sciences. So you either have to get an exemption okay. or you have to um, figure that out in some other way that satisfies that requirement. But the IB is difficult, it's difficult to do the IB and, and then pursue and medicine, medicine in India. Um, you asked me about the HSC. Yes. So for HSC students, I think who want to study abroad, they do need to supplement. They do need to supplement their um, the rigor of their curriculum a little bit because it isn't necessarily. Um, so for example, if you do commerce and HSC, right. you will not have done science. Right. And um, in the UK, it's different, but in the US, you will need to have some science under your belt um, as a just a, a well-rounded um, student. So you may have to take an AP, which is a different kind of an exam. Um, US-based exam in AP in biology or something, just to show that you have proficiency in sciences. So it, it becomes a little complicated for students in right, state boards. Right, right. Um, so Kim, uh, this brings us to the important question, um, what makes Red Pen so instrumental in this process? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of places where we really try to intervene in the process. And when we're talking about really early planning, it's really about just getting parents aware of, of what, what are the different um, components, criteria, and processes you need to really be thinking about if you want to send your child abroad. Now, abroad is a huge, um, you know, sort yeah. of landscape and that, that, that has lots of um, variations in it. So if you want to go to the U.S., you need to think about this. If you want to go to the U.K., maybe think about this, you know, Singapore, Australia, etc. Every place is different and, and is looking for different things and students. So that's one thing that we try to do early on. And in, and suppose I, I give you that information and you decide I really, really want my child to go to the U.S. Well, then U.S. extracurriculars are important. Sure. And um, and as you know, and before any of that is said, the for most important thing everywhere in the world is your academics, your grades, right. how good of a student you are. So that that's the number one priority. Then for the U.S., we come to extracurriculars. How do we develop those? What is your child interested in? And like you said, if you if a child maybe hasn't found their thing, how do we help them um, 
narrow down a couple of things from the list of activities they've been involved in, um, deepen them, go maybe, you know, go beyond school and um, kind of uh, find their way in that activity in a more, in a, in a way that's more meaningful to them. Sure. Uh, and uh, how, what makes the Red Pen distinctive versus, um, you know, the other, other services that are um, available? That's a good question. I think, you know, a lot of a lot of things that we do are we really try to kind of really get to know the family and the student and understand their goals and objectives and I think rather than um, buying into the hype around um, aspirational colleges and you know and and packaging students in a particular way you know I mean we really don't we don't think that will work and so you know trying to really get the each family and each student to um, explore what's driving them and then find the best fit or the best match whether it's in terms of college or country or or whatever i think we really do care about making sure that people you know get to the right place to achieve the goals they ultimately have right and, and uh, you know while i was reading uh, and chatting with your team what what stood out for me was was your team because yes. each of each of the members are from uh, well placed university so they've been through that grind themselves yes, right yes. I mean, I think we have a lot of strengths in, in our team from that point of view, um, of course. However, I think the other important thing is that many of us are from different, we come from different parts of the world. Right. And so what we, uh, people who want, you know, students who want to study abroad, we are kind of translating that process for them. It's like, okay, well, this is what the U.S., when they say this, this is what they mean. Or in Canada, this is what this means. Or wherever. So we have, we have people on our team from everywhere, honestly, right. um, all over the world. Um, Kim, tell us about the last few placements that the Red Pen has done and what stood out from each of those placements that you did about the students, about their resumes, about their them as a family that you feel like worked in their favor. Yeah, so um, a couple of students come to mind. I think, you know, there a few students come to mind. Um, I think that they're, they're the common thread in, the, in all their stories. Um, is that the students are in, are driven themselves. The parents are not driving the process. And that's important. I mean, I think it's wonderful when parents support their, their children, um, but I think they also need to really let, let students take the wheel and, and drive the process because that's when I see the most success. That's when I see students really caring about, you know, what, what, what happens next. And when, they, when they're in that position, they, um, they do much better. So just, you know, specific examples. I worked with a girl this year from um, a tier two city, and she was, and in her case, you know, her parents, um, I think there, there, there was a family situation where parents were separated or she was estranged from one parent. So she was quite independent. And um, she, they didn't have a lot of money, but this was something that, you know, she wanted to try. And she was very, very um, strong academically. And she worked through some um, really interesting and unique community-based um, extracurricular activities like um, working in farmers markets and also with, with some, you know, some other people who had organized them. And also, you know, she'd done a lot of music. And, you know, she just really kind of stood out for being someone who was out of the box and out of the box in a tier two city, which is hard to do, right. harder to do. Um, and I think she, you know, one of, the, one of the things she finally did, which really surprised me, and it has nothing to do with extracurriculars or anything, but she, she got a perfect score on the SAT2 English literature test, which Indian students don't normally do. They get 800s on physics, math, chemistry, but for someone to get um, that score on the English literature part of the exam is like, it really shows that she, she just knows what she wants and what she's doing, and she's doing it from a, from a very um, sincere place. Yeah. So she did really well. She got an early decision um, um, admissions into a call into you know a top 20 university in the US with a full scholarship so I'm very happy wow. for her That's really yeah so she's one and then another another student that um, recently was admitted to two very um, highly competitive very prestigious universities was um, he you know he'd done so much research independent research um, with faculty in in colleges and universities and research organizations across India. He'd done many, many, many summer programs in the U.S., very okay. rigorous ones, competitive summer programs. And he was um, just so far advanced in science and, and math, which is what he wanted to pursue, that, you know, there was just, it was really, it would have been very, very hard for any admissions officer to look at his file and, and find fault. You okay. know, he, and, and that was 
not something again that you know his mother was driving him or, or that he was being forced to do he just authentically was like I want to work in you know a lab that's doing advanced research so he found someone and did it you know and so I think there are um, you know there are, in all these examples I just feel like you know I keep I, I always emphasize this is just you know I can tell students so much their parents can do so much but unless the student is is behind this whole process 100% it isn't gonna work right. so I think that's the most important thing um, also you know this interesting thing that you brought out about uh, you know the Indian students doing well in science math and all of that but not so well in English mm -hmm. have you seen um, I mean, why is it that Indian students are pursuing abroad? Mm -hmm. So mostly, I mean, the same things they pursue here, which is yeah. engineering and business. Okay. Um, like I said, uh, medicine is medicine. You cannot really do yeah. abroad as much. You can a little. That's another topic. Um, but um, business engineering are the most popular topic um, majors that students are looking at. Economics is another popular one. Um, more and more, I, I am seeing more students who are interested in liberal arts. Um, but what's really heartening is even a student who goes into, let's say, um, economics or engineering, they might come back a few years later and say, oh yeah, I changed my major to environmental sustainability, or I changed my major to um, women's studies from history, or something you know that's that's that shows that they've taken the op they've they've made the most of the opportunity of being in a in an environment where they are exposed to new ideas. Right. And that brings that, that that very interesting that you asked that because one of our readers had actually asked us this. Like a lot of Indian universities don't let you change your subjects right. as you move along in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But is that the liberty that the foreign universities offer Indian students? So only the U.S. The U.S. Okay. is the most flexible. Canada also allows um, change of major. Um, the U.K. does not at all. The U.K. is exactly like India. So if, if you are a student who knows exactly what you want to study and you never want to explore anything else, then the U.K. is a good choice for you. Um, the U.S. could be a good choice for you, but again, someone who's really fixated on um, pursuing statistics in the U.K., they may never want to take a writing course or a course in you know political science but if you go to the US because of the sort of philosophy of liberal education right. where you have to get that broad base it's required you have to do um, breadth subject requirements as well as your major subject requirements interesting um, <clears throat> what age should parents start connecting or looking at um, you know um, looking at opening up horizons or start mm -hmm. connecting with uh, you know, with the red pen if they're looking at pursuing right. education abroad? So, I mean, again, that, that will depend on every family and every school. Some schools actually do a lot of orientation for students um, and so parents become aware of what, what the process, what's involved in the process earlier. So they don't really require such early planning. But I think in general, you know, because because colleges um, in the U.S. look at everything from ninth grade onwards, I think ninth grade is a good time to if you're if you're if you have questions about the process, ninth grade is a good time to come and sit down and with us and understand. You know how do we need to plan going forward? And you may learn that you're on track, which is great. But you may sort of say in ninth grade, okay, we're on track for now, but next year we're going to have to make subject selections in eleventh and twelfth grade, so we'll come back. Right. And we'll understand, you know, how do those choices impact what's possible going forward. So there are many kind of checkpoints along the way, and I think at any of those checkpoints, if student, if parents feel uneasy or ungrounded in the information they have, is a good time. Um, we do meet families as young as, uh, you know, we meet parents usually, not the children, as young as you know, fifth, sixth grade. Yeah. But that's usually because the family is trying to make a decision about, you know, an international board or. Um, or something like that, or or they're moving back to India and they want to know, you know, what kind of a school should they look at for their child, and then we kind of go through what what the options are and, and how. Great, Kim. Last few thoughts on what would you like to sum this conversation up with? Um, I think what I'd like to say um, to sum it up is I think you know there are a few critical decision making points for families. The rest is is a little flexible, and I I just want to encourage parents um, and students also. It's okay. Everything is going to be fine. <laughs> You'll be all right. Um, you know, kind of just there's always there's always room to pivot. There's there's ways there are ways to change. There are ways to work around different situations so that you know everyone is 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 achieving the goals in the end. Right. So I think that what stood what somewhat stood out for me in this whole conversation was one that your child needs to be driving this for sure. Yes. Yes, because uh, Indian parents are quite aggressive, really pushy, so yes. we tend to be in the driver's seat always. And the other one is there's no formula to it. Yes, right? those are those are two 
Maybe those those police. really stood out for me somewhere yes. because uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, the Princeton guys probably figured out that you know this is the yes. second <laughs> second consecutive copy table book. So I mean, those those two kind of really resonate yes, with me. No, they really you just can't package it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so sure. much for joining. It was an absolute pleasure and we look forward to connecting with you and connecting with the Red Pen. For all of those who are looking at connecting with them, you will find uh, details down in the description below. So you can most, uh, you know, in, in all likelihood connect with them uh, with whatever questions you have and, we, and they'll be happy to answer that for you. Uh, so thank you so much, Kim, and uh, see you guys next week.